All right, guys, let's get going again on where the red fern grows. And I know it's been a very long time, um, over a month now. Um, so I will remind you, when we left off, um, they had just um, finished the part where um, he had taken um, that bet and they went to get the coon and Reuben had fallen on the axe and died. And then he went and they went to the grave to see Reuben's grave. And it made him feel a lot better to pay his respects um, to the grave. So now um, we're going to find out what happens next. Chapter 14. A few days later, on his way back from the mill, one of the Hatfield boys stopped at our place. He told me my grandfather wanted to see me. It was unusual for Grandpa to send for me, and it had me worried. I figured that he wanted to talk to me about the death of Reuben Pritchard. I always enjoyed talking to my grandpa, but I didn't want to talk about Reuben's death. Every time I thought of him, I lived the horrible tragedy all over again. After a practically sleepless night, the next morning I started for the store. I was walking along deep in thought when little Ann zipped by me. She was as happy as a young gray squirrel. She wiggled and twisted, and once she barked at me. I looked behind me. There was old Dan trotting along. He stopped, and I turned around. Little Ann came up to me. I scolded them and tried to explain that I wasn't going hunting. I was just going to the store to see what my grandpa wanted. They couldn't or didn't want to understand. I picked up a small stick and slapped my leg with it. In a deep voice, I said, Now you go home. I'm going to wear you out. This hurt their feelings. With their tails between their legs and trotting side by side, they started back. Every little way, they would stop and look back at me. It was too much. I couldn't stand it. I began to feel bad all over. Well, all right, I said. Come on, you can go. But, Dan, if there are any dogs around the store and you get in a fight, I won't take you hunting for a whole year. And I mean that, although I knew I didn't. They came running, tickled to death. Little Ann took one of her silly spells. She started nipping at the long red tail of old Dan. Not getting any reaction from him, she jumped over him. She barked at him. She wouldn't even look at her. He wouldn't even look at her. She ran around in front of him and laid down in the trail, acting like a cat ready to spring. Stiff-legged, he walked up close to her, stopped, and showed his teeth. I laughed out loud. I knew he wouldn't bite her any more than he'd bite me. He was just acting tough because he was a boy dog. After several attempts to get him to play, little Ann gave up. Together, they started sniffing around in the underbrush. As I walked up in the front of the store, Grandpa hollered at me from the barn. I went over to him. Right away, he wanted to know all about Reuben's accident. He listened while I told the story over again. After I had my say, Grandpa stood looking down at the ground. There was a deep frown on his face and a hurt look in his eyes. His quietness made me feel uneasy. He finally raised his head and looked at me. What I could see in his friendly old face tore at my heart. It seemed that there were more wrinkles than I had ever seen before. His uncombed, iron-gray hair looked almost white. I noticed that his wrinkled old hand trembled as he rubbed the wire-stiff stubble on his chin. In a low voice that quivered as he talked, he said, Billy, I'm sorry about all this. Truly sorry. I can't help but feel that in a way it was my fault. No, Grandpa, I said. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't anyone's fault. It just happened and no one could help it. I know, he said, but if I hadn't called Reuben's bet, nothing would have happened. I guess when a man gets old, he doesn't think straight. I shouldn't have let those boys get under my skin. Grandpa, I said, Reuben and Rainy could get under anybody's skin. You couldn't help that. Why, they get under everyone's skin that gets close to them. Yeah, I know, he said, but still I acted like a fool. Billy, I had no idea things were going to turn out like they did, or I wouldn't have called that bet. Wanting to change the conversation, I said, Grandpa, we won that bet fair and square, but they took my money anyway. I saw the fire come back to his eyes. This made me feel better. He was more like the grandpa I loved. That's all right, he said. We'll just forget the whole thing. He stepped over and laid his hand on my shoulder. In a solemn voice, he said, We won't talk about this again. Now, I want you to forget it ever happened because it wasn't your fault. Oh, I know it's hard for any boy to completely forget something like that. All through your life, you'll think of it now and then, but try not to let it bother you and don't ever feel guilty about it. It's not good for a young boy to feel that way. I nodded my head, thinking if people would just stop questioning me about Reuben's death, maybe I could forget. Grandpa said, well, the accident wasn't the only thing I wanted to talk to you about. I've got something else, something I think will help both of us forget a lot of things. The twinkle in Grandpa's eyes reminded me of what my father had said. Seems like that old man can cook up more deals than anyone in the country. I didn't care how many deals Grandpa cooked up. He was still the best Grandpa in the whole wide world. What have you got? I asked. Come over to the store, he said, and I'll show you. On our way over, I heard him mutter, I hope this doesn't turn out like the ghost coon hunt. 
On entering the store, Grandpa walked to the post office department and came back with a newspaper in his hand. He spread it out on the counter. Pointing with his finger, he said in a loud voice, Look there! I looked. The large black letters read, Championship Coon Hunt to be held. My eyes popped open. Again, I read the words. Grandpa was chuckling. I said, Boy, if that isn't something, a championship coon hunt? Wide-eyed asked, Where are they having this hunt, and what does it have to do with us? Grandpa was getting excited. Off came his glasses, and out came the old red handkerchief. He blew his breath on the lens and polished them. He snorted a time or two, reared back, and almost shouted, Do with us? Oh, there's my kitty. Why, it has everything to do with us. All my life I've wanted to go to one of these big coon hunts. Why, I've even dreamed about it. And now the opportunity has come. Yes, sir, now I can go, he paused. That is, if it's all right with you. I was uh, dumbfounded. I said, all right with me? Why, Grandpa, you know it's all right with me. But what have I got to do with it? Grandpa was so excited, I thought he was going to burst a blood vessel. Talking excitedly, he said, I've got it all fixed, Billy. We can enter old Dan and little Ann in this championship hunt. I was so surprised at what Grandpa had said, I couldn't utter a word. At first, I was scared, and then a wonderful feeling came over me. I felt the excitement of the big hunt as it burned its way into my body. I started breathing like I had been running for a hundred miles. After several attempts, I croaked, can, can just any dog be in this hunt? Grandpa almost jumped as he entered. No, sir, not just any hound can be entered. They have to be the best, and they have to be registered, too. He started talking with his hands, pointing to a chair. He said, sit down, and I'll tell you all about it. Grandpa calmed down a little and started talking in a serious voice. Billy, he said, it takes some doing to have a set of dogs entered into this hunt. I've been working on this for months. I've written letters on top of letters. I've even had several good friends in town helping me. You see, I've kept a record of all the coons your dogs have caught, and believe me, their catch is up there with the best of them. Now, I have already paid the entry fee, and everything is fixed. All we have to do is go. Entry fee? How much did it cost? I asked. You let me worry about that, he said. Now, what you do, what do you say? Want to give it a whirl? I understand the winner receives a gold cup, and you never can tell. We might come home with it. We have as good a chance as anyone else. Grandpa had me so worked up by this time, I didn't think anyone else had any good hounds but me. I reared back and blurted, It's all right with me, Grandpa. Just tell me what to do. Grandpa flew out of gear like a Model T Ford. He slapped the counter with his hand. In a pent-up voice, he said, That's the boy. That's the way I like to hear a coon hunter talk. With a questioning look on his face, he asked, Didn't I see your dogs with you when you came up? Yeah, they followed me. I said, They're outside. Well, call them in, he said. I've got something for them. I called to them. Little Ann came in the store walking like she was scared. Old Dan came to the door and stopped. I tried to coax him in. It was no use. My dogs, never being allowed in the house, were scared to come in. Grandpa walked over to a hoop of cheese and cut off two chunks about the size of my fist. He walked to the door talking to old Dan. What's the matter, boy? He said, you scared to come in? Well, that shows you're a good dog. He handed him a piece of cheese. I heard it rattle in his throat as he gulped it down. Grandpa came back and set little Ann up on the counter. He chuckled as he broke the cheese up in small pieces and fed her. Yes, sir, he said, I think we must have the best darn coon hounds in these Ozark Mountains. And just as sure as shooting, we're going to win that gold cup. Grandpa didn't have to say that. The way I was feeling, I already had the cup. All I had to do was go and get it. Finished with his feeding of little Ann, Grandpa said, Now, let's see. The hunt starts on the 23rd. That's about, well, let's see. This is the 17th. Counting on his fingers, he finally figured it out. That's six days from now, he said in a jubilant voice. I nodded my head. We can leave here early on the morning of the 22nd, he said. And barring accidents, we should make the campground in plenty of time for the grand opening. I asked how we were going. We'll go in my buggy, he said. I'll load the tent and everything the night before. I asked what he wanted me to bring. Nothing, he said, but these two little hounds, and you be here early, and I believe I'd let these dogs rest, because we want them in tip-top shape when we get there. <coughs> I saw the thinking wrinkles bunch up on Grandpa's forehead. You reckon your daddy would like to go, he asked. As late into the fall as it is, I don't think he's too busy, is he? No, our crops are all gathered, I said. We've been clearing some of them off the bottom land, and that's almost done now. Well, ask him, he said. Tell him I'd like to have him go. I'll ask him, I said, but you know how Pop is. The farm comes first with him. I know, Grandpa said, but you ask him anyway and tell him what I said. Now, it's getting late and you'd better be heading for home. I was almost to the door when Grandpa said, wait a minute. He walked over behind the candy counter and shook out one of the quarter sacks. He filled it up to the brim, bounced it on the counter a few times, and dropped in a few more gumdrops. With a twinkle in his eye and a smile on his face, he handed it to me, saying, Save some for your sisters. 
I was so choked up I couldn't say anything. I took it and flew out the door, calling to my dogs. On my way home, I didn't walk on the ground. I was way up in the clouds, just skipping along. With a song, I told the sycamore trees and the pop-eyed gray squirrels how happy I was. Little Ann sensed my happiness. She pranced along on the trail. With a doggish grin on her face, she begged for a piece of candy, which I so gladly gave. Even old Dan felt the pleasant atmosphere. His long red tail fanned the air. Once he raised his head and bawled, I stood still and listened to the droning tones of his deep voice. The sound seemed to be trapped for an instant in the thick timber. It rolled around under the tall white sycamores, beat its way through the wild cane, and found freedom out over the clear blue waters of the river. The sound, following the river's course, rolled like the beat of a jungle drum. As the echo died away in the distance, silence settled over the bottoms. The gray squirrels stopped their chattering. The wild birds quit their singing. I stood still. No sound could be heard. It seemed that all the creatures of the wild were holding their breath. I gazed up to the towering heights of the tall trees. No leaf was stirring. The silence seemed strained and expectant, like a young boy waiting for a firecracker to explode. I looked at old Dan. He was standing perfectly still, with his right foot right front foot raised and his long ears fanned open. He seemed to be listening and challenging any living creature to make a noise. The silence was broken by the wee of a red-tailed hawk. This seemed to be a signal. All around me, the happy atmosphere resumed to its natural state. I heard the bam-bam-bam of a woodpecker high in the top of a box elder snag. The cry of a kingfisher and the scream of a blue jay blended perfectly with the drum-like beat. A barking red squirrel glued to the side of a hackberry tree kept time to the music with the beat of his tail. Each noise I heard and each sight I saw was very familiar to me, but I never grew tired of listening and watching. They were a godsend gift and I enjoyed them all. As I skipped along, it was hard for me to realize all the wonderful things that had happened to me in such a few short years. I had two of the finest little hounds that had ever bawled on the trail of a ringtail coon. I had a wonderful mother and father and three little sisters. I had the best grandpa a boy ever had to top it all. I was going on a championship coon hunt. It was no wonder that my heart was bursting with happiness. Wasn't I the luckiest boy in the world? Everyone was just sitting down to supper when I got home. My sisters quit the table for the candy. I told them to divide it equally. The oldest one asked if I wanted any of it. No, I said, I brought it all for you. Of course, I didn't tell them about the four pieces I had in my pocket. They thanked me with their clear blue eyes. I guess it's pretty hard for a young boy to fool his mama. She took one look at me and called me over. She ruffled up my hair, kissed me, and said, If my little boy's eyes get any bigger, they're going to pop right out of his head. Now tell me, what are you so happy about? Before I could say anything, Papa chuckled and asked, What's going on between you and your grandpa? What are you and that old man cooking up now? As fast as I could talk, I started telling about the big coon hunt. I told how hard Grandpa had been working to have my dogs entered and how he already had paid my entry fee. Catching my breath and looking at Papa, I said, We're going in his buggy and he wants you to go too. I waited in silence for his reply. Papa sat there staring off into space, sipping his coffee and saying nothing. I knew he was thinking. In the silence, I was sure I could hear my heart thumping. I said, Papa, please go. We'll have a lot of fun. And besides, the winner receives a big golden cup. He scratched his head and said, Billy, I'd sure like to go, but I don't see how I can with all this work around here. I was beginning to think that Papa wasn't going to go. Then Mama started talking. Work, she said. Why, all the work is practically done. I don't know of one thing you couldn't put off for a few days. Why don't you go? You haven't been anywhere since I don't know when. It's not the only work I'm thinking of, Papa said. It's you and the girls. Ah, well, don't worry about me and the girls, Mama said. We'll be all right. Besides, it'll be several months yet before I need any help. When Mama said this, it dawned on me. I had been so busy with my coon hunt and I hadn't noticed anything unusual. Mama's tummy was all swelled up. She was going to have a baby. I felt guilty for not having noticed. I went over and put my arms around her and kissed her. Papa spoke up. It's sure going to be a big hunt, he said. I heard something about it up at the store one day. Grandpa said there'd be hunters there from everywhere, I said, and some of the best coon hounds in the country. Do you think you have a chance to win the cup, Papa asked. I started to answer him when the little one piped up. They can't beat old Dan and little Ann, she said. I just bet they can't. Everyone laughed at her serious remark. I would have kissed her, but she had candy, cornbread, and molasses all over her face. I told Papa I didn't know how good those dogs were, but there was one thing I did know. If they beat mine, they would have to hunt harder than they'd ever had before. After I had had my say about the dogs, a silence settled over the dining room. Everyone was looking at Papa and waiting for his answer. I saw a pleased smile spread over his face. He stood up. All right, I'll go, he said. 
and by golly, we'll bring that gold cup back too. My sister started clapping their hands and squealing with delight. A satisfied smile spread over my mother's face. At that moment, I'm sure no boy in the world could have been happier than I. Tears of happiness rolled down my cheeks. Mama wiped them away with her apron. In the midst of all the excitement, my little sister, saying not a word, climbed down from her chair. No one said anything. We just watched her. Still clutching a spoon in her small hand, she came around the table and walked up to me. Looking down at the floor in a bashful voice, she said, Can I have the gold cup? Putting my finger under her sticky little chin, I tilted her head up. I smiled as I looked in her clear blue eyes, and I said, Honey, if I win it, I'll give it to no one but you. I had to cross my heart and hope to die several times before she was satisfied. Back in her chair, she gloated over the others. You just wait and see, she said. It'll be mine, nobody's but mine, and I'll put my banty eggs in it. Silly, you don't put banty eggs in a gold cup, the oldest one said. They're just made to look at. That night, I dreamed about gold cups, little red hounds, and coons as big as rain barrels. Once I woke myself up, whooping to my dogs. I'm going to stop there. And we're going to come back to this, but that's been 15, 16 minutes of me reading. And um, we'll give you guys a break and come back to it for part two of chapter 14.